Every year, MIT Technology Review makes a list of 10 breakthroughs we think will have a big impact on the world. We've identified things like natural language processing, augmented reality, CRISPR, wireless charging, and gene therapy before they went mainstream. So when we heard Bill Gates was interested in helping us choose this year's list, we jumped at the chance. Through his investing and the work of the Gates Foundation, he's thinking a lot about where technology is going and how it can do the most good for the most people. We offered Bill a short list. He ignored it almost entirely. This list is very much his own vision. I sat down with him to talk about what he picked. You're famously optimistic. Um, and you know you subscribe to the view of people like Hans Rosling and Steven Pinker that um, when you look at the important indicators, life has been getting better consistently for billions of people. How do you sustain that kind of optimism in a world in which uh, you know climate change is uh, accelerating? We have political polarization and disruption caused by social media. Um, we have uh, growing economic inequality, which is fueled at least in part by automation and AI. So there's a lot of worries about the technology having harmful effects. So how do you retain your optimism? It's great that people are worried about the problems uh, because they require action. You know, even take inequity, globally inequity is down. That is, mm -hmm. the poor countries are getting richer uh, faster than the richer countries are getting richer. Right. The bulk of humanity lives in middle-income countries today. Uh, if you go back 50 years, uh, there were very, very few middle-income countries. It was pretty bimodal, where you had India and China, Africa were poor, and then Europe, US, um, Japan starting to be fairly well off and not much in the middle. But today, uh, China's at the high end of middle income, India's at the low end of middle income, Brazil, Indonesia. It's a, it's a phenomenal story. And the ability of science to solve problems, uh, you know, clearly in the case of heart disease and cancer, we'll make a lot of progress. Some of the more chronic diseases like depression, diabetes, I'm optimistic, even obesity, uh, you know, we're gaining some fundamental understandings of the microbiome and the signaling mechanisms involved in these things. So yes, I am optimistic. It does bother me that, that most people aren't optimistic. And, you know, so one of us is wrong and one of us is right. Do you think <laughs> that you have maybe successful person's bias? In other words, you're of, some- Of course, we have to factor that in. Right. At my own life, you know, I've been extremely lucky uh, and, you know, the country I was born in, the education I got to have, the business work I got to do, even my foundation work is amazing and interesting work. But even subtracting out from my uh, uh, personal characteristics and personal experience, I, I think the big picture is that it's better to be born today than ev ever, and it'll be better to be born 20 years from now than today. So I want to talk about some of the individual technologies you picked for the list. So one of them is lab-grown meat, um, which is still very tentative, still very expensive. Uh, why was that important enough to make the cut? And do you, do you think that in, a, I don't know, a decade, two decades, we could see lab-grown meat replacing a substantial proportion of animal-grown meat? Yes, I do. Part of the reason I picked it is, is to remind people that clean energy does not solve climate change. You know, every time you read about, oh, clean energy, it, that's it. We just need clean energy. No, you don't. That's only about a quarter of the emissions come from electricity uh, generation. So here you have a gigantic piece that is from uh, beef production. And now uh, this can be a substitute. So this is a category that people weren't paying much attention to as a greenhouse gas problem, and yet, I think the path to solve it is clearer than in, in say, the cement or steel or other materials case. Right. Uh, another technology you picked is AI virtual assistant. So the, the reference there is to improvements in things like natural language processing. Um, but you know these are still AIs that are basically very dumb machines. They very do dumb. one narrow task really well. The computer is so stupid that when you're 
when you present email, you don't let it order it for you. You don't trust it to have enough context to look at the material, understand the relationships uh, and your calendar that it orders them for you. You, uh, you pick which application to run. You pick which item to open. So it's working at a very, very low level today. I do think that uh, we'll have executive assistant type capability in a five to 10 year period. Now, you know, I've known to be too optimistic about some of these IT things in the past, but the generally uh, they have progressed. And, you know, it's a huge priority project for companies like Google and Microsoft. And on some things like translation, you know, the deep learning approaches are surprisingly good. And so I work on that a lot in my part-time work with Microsoft and, uh, you know, I want one, so. Right, so in that case, it's gonna happen. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pick another of the technologies that you picked, which I think is probably near and dear to your heart, which is the reinvented toilet. And you've explained this as the biggest advance in sanitation in 200 years. So tell us some more about that. Well, the technologies are often decent enough that you know, they stay the same. And so the idea of building sewers, using clean water, uh, having a processing plant, you know, that's the paradigm in, in rich countries. Unfortunately, in, in, uh, even in some middle income, but certainly in low income countries, the idea that you're going to build that sewer system, the capital cost to do it is just unattainable. And yet the quality of life both in terms of disgust and disease, when you're not taking the human waste and getting it out of an increasingly urbanized world, mm. you know, Africa will, although it's the last place, it will be 50% urban 20 years from now. Will the kids there be healthy? But maybe just describe briefly what it does. Okay, well, it takes the human waste the liquid and solid, and in some cases it treats it as a uniform group. In some, most cases it does some type of separation. Uh, the solids you can essentially burn. Uh, the liquids you can filter. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the uh, cost of the equipment that does this reliably uh, is a real challenge, and the net energy. Now, burning the solid part, actually, you get energy, but whether you can make the balance, if you actually have to boil the liquid part, that uses up a, a lot of energy. Right. Uh, and, and so the technologies we have today work, but you know the cost per seat is over $5,000, and there's even maintenance that has to go into those things. To really get into those slums, we're gonna have to get down to, the ultimate is the single family household so the woman doesn't have to go out at night. Mm. That we need to be less than $500. Right. And so, you know, there are days that's, you know, it's kind of an intimidating target. Is there another technology like that, which is, you know, something that has been around for so long and is so well established that nobody even thinks of innovating in it, but that actually in the same way as the toilet could be a, you know, ripe, ripe for disruption? There are cases where the sort of trickle-down approach of, okay, the rich world does something some way, right. and now, hey, the poor world just learn to do it. Um, you know, in the rich world, going to your doctors and getting regular medication sort of works. Actually, compliance isn't that good. What we'd really like for the rest of the world is something like a drug depot, where it's doing continuous release, so that, say, you have to take six months of TB medicine, or you have to constantly have some HIV prophylactic drug in your uh, body at a, a certain level. Uh, drug depots would help the, the poor world application a lot. It's not necessary for the rich world. Mm. And so there you have to challenge scientists to do something that if they just look at the rich, rich world target product profiles, they won't see it. Likewise, you know, keeping vaccines cold in places where you have lots of electricity reliably, uh, stick it in the refrigerator, that's fine. In Africa, as we get out into rural areas, we've had to challenge engineers to create new types of refrigeration, and you know that 
you know, looks like it's rolling out in a positive way. So trickle down works for a lot of things, you know, cell phones, chips, you know, measles vaccine. Uh, but it it isn't you're going to miss a lot of potential innovation if, if you insist on that. And toilets is one where it's even hard to see how some of these big Indian cities will ever deal with their waste uh, if all we have is sewer sanitation and large-scale sanitation processing. Right. So you lead a $1 billion investment fund, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, which is investing in a whole bunch of different technologies, not all of them energy generation, uh, but that are about limiting emissions. The question I have is, you know, there, there, it feels like there are already a lot of technological solutions to climate change. And do, do we really need more of them? Or is the biggest problem not political, about governments implementing them and creating the incentives for them to be taken up? When you say to India, should you provide electricity to everyone to have things we take for granted, heating, air conditioning, uh, their path uh, is to build more coal plants. That's the cheapest form of electricity uh, for them. And so, yes, the rich countries are rich enough that if they chose to, mm -hmm. they could pay huge premium prices for electricity. Now. The re reliability piece, you know, uh, Shmiel talks about you have seven days in, in Tokyo where you have no sun, no wind. Right. You know, the, the overall cost of electricity in Tokyo would be, for the entire year, would be more than doubled mm -hmm. to have a 100% renewable solution. We don't have ways of making cement, steel, meat that are zero emissions, even at a, a doubled premium for those things. Mm -hmm. You know, in France, they were asked to pay a 5% uh, increase on their their diesel price. Right, right. And it's that huge. was unacceptable. So the willingness to uh, go for super expensive things whose only benefit is their reduction in greenhouse gas emission, mm -hmm. it's just not there. Politics is where you decide how much you're going to put into basic research or how you're going to, going to make things attractive for these innovative companies or how you're going to uh, let things roll out when they're in a less mature state. But no, if, if we froze technology today, mm -hmm. you will live in a four degrees C warmer world in the future, right. guaranteed. And you said recently that you want the U.S. to regain its lead, and you're going to try to persuade the leaders of this country to regain the lead in nuclear power. If we didn't have climate change, the quest to get broad acceptance of nuclear power wouldn't be a priority for me. The general public attitude towards nuclear is a real challenge, and the economics are a real challenge. So if you can solve safety, uh, including the perception of safety, and solve the economics, uh, you know, that uh, would be fantastic. It's not easy. You also have to convince people that uh, you're not going to have a shortage of uranium, you're not going to have proliferation, and that the waste isn't going to be a huge problem. But the, the two big problems are the economics and the safety. And it's so daunting, there are very few entities working on it, even though the digital tools we have now, it's insane that we're not building uh, a new reactor design. China is probably the place that's most positive for nuclear energy. As you say, even there, the populace is asking questions about the safety, mm -hmm. and some of the reactors that have been built, you know, did have cost overruns. And the way that that they're balancing their power generation and their grid, they have some challenges there that are hurting the economics of all energy producers. So that gives us a nice segue to start talking about China. Um, it has laid out these plans to be the world's leading technology superpower within the next few decades. Um, it's got plans in a bunch of specific areas. Uh, do you think it can get there? But it's impressive what China's done. Mm. But China's strength in digital areas, even in biology, where they're probably five years behind where they are in digital technologies, it is very impressive. I mean, Tsinghua is one of the top 10 universities in the in the world and the number of science graduates in China is, is far greater than in other places. The the real question you have to ask is innovation in China good for the world if they cure some form of cancer 
if they have seeds that are more productive, is that a good thing? In the realm of economics, it's not zero sum. Mm -hmm. It's really good. The only zero sum game there is is war. And so, you know, I don't think we should end up in in a, in a war with China. So a trade the, war or any other kind of war. Right. So the idea that they're starting to be innovative, mm -hmm. uh, that is good for the world. And like most countries in middle income status, they're more willing to do big projects and up upset the status quo. The U.S. in the 50s and 60s, uh, you know, Japan in 70s and 80s, Korea 80s and 90s, there's that middle income state where your, your technological capability gets really strong and you're willing, uh, you know, whether it's your infrastructure or uh, science to, to go out and do very, very ambitious things. The U.S., it's good to have a sense, okay, we have to renew uh, our edge. You know, in fact, Japan was never going to overtake us in terms of scientific innovation. But I do think in the 70s and 80s when we were like, oh, geez, uh, you know, ha have they figured things out? We haven't, you know, that we renewed our commitment to basic research. So it will be post-World War II, it'll be the first time that we have a, a broad technological competitor that actually uses the commercial market as uh, the way they get their strengths. The Soviets had the problem that they didn't have the, the commercial side. And so it meant that although their scientific understanding was very good, their ability to actually make things in an economic way fell way behind what we had. And so we had you know, incredible global uniqueness that mm. we, that's kind of spoiled us in a way. We won't have as much uniqueness relative to China, even though we're likely to stay number one for a long time. Thank you very, very much, Bill. That was a really fascinating Yeah, great to talk to you. Great.